Today, um, so-called global health perspective, uh, in particular, uh, we're going to talk about public health at the international scale. We're not talking necessarily about doctors, okay, clinicians, nurses that are working directly with people. We're talking about broader public health issues. So public health is like health of groups of people versus the doctor is medical doctor we think of them as normally focused on the health of an individual however medical doctors go into public health of course and worry about health of groups um, and then we're going to talk about um, connections a little bit to development um, remember the HDI the human development index it had um, three dimension so-called dimension indices those are uh, health education and income income was a proxy for standard of living Education, well, for knowledge, um, development of the mind, so to speak. And health, the way they measured it was in a roundabout way and simply measured life expectancy. So the theory there is if you're ill, sick a lot, and poor health, you die younger. Okay? And uh, you can see it in the, if you correlate um, what you normally think of as developing countries and you sort of rank them and then you compare that to life expectancy, of course, life expectancy goes down for poorer countries, okay? Um, so health is really considered by many to be extremely <coughs> fundamental in development of people. And if you think about it for a minute, it, it, it is, because young people like yourselves, you know, don't often, or you're lucky enough not to have to worry about health, your own health, usually you're real healthy. Now, I know there's people in the class who are laughing to themselves and saying, yeah, right. Um, if you have health problems, you know, you know how important health is. Uh, you think about your parents, maybe their health problems, your siblings, your relatives. Mm -hmm. It's really fundamental, but when you have a health problem yourself, it really hits home, okay? Um, now, to begin our discussion today, we're going to watch a movie. Uh, I'm sorry, that there were a few people who watched this two weeks ago. Um, this is the movie Beyond Scarcity. Uh, power poverty and the global water crisis. It's about Kibera in Nairobi, um, Africa. Krista has been there. Okay, so Krista, did you post your? No. She's gonna post. She has pictures, very nice pictures, like in a talk, right? Yeah. Yeah, and she's gonna post them at the website in case you'd like to look. Um, really fasc fascinating um, pictures. I'd really recommend that you take a look at those. But. Uh, um, today, what we're going to do is look at um, uh, a movie that was put on, put together by the UN Development Program. Okay, so let's uh, go full screen. And, uh, oh, I need my microphone cord. crisis that we're talking about is not ultimately about scarcity, it's about the management and the governance of water. What we're trying to do in the report is to draw attention to the way that water is priced, the way that it's allocated to different groups in society. Not having water means that women are walking three or four hours a day to carry 20 kilo cans of water back to their homes. Not having enough water means that you have insufficient water to maintain the most basic functions of life, to keep your children healthy, to quench your thirst, to wash yourself in, to maintain your dignity. There are over two billion people in the world who don't have access to sanitation. But actually, it wasn't really until I stood here that I understood what, what that means. What we've got here is a toilet for 71,000 people 
these are plastic bags that are full of human excrement. People just dump them here because they have no alternative. When it rains, this whole hillside of human excrement and plastic bags floods, come straight down this hill into this residential area down here. And even worse than that, what you've got here is the main water pipe, which is serving the whole slum. This water pipe is completely covered with human excrement. In some places, it's leaking. So you've got excrement actually leaching into the water supply. You see an example of this problem right, right here. This is a feeder pipe. This water is full of human excrement. And it's being sucked into this pipe right here where you can see it leaking. Now, th this is basically going to carry human excrement right into the water that somebody drinks down, down, this, uh, down this lane here. And that really helps to explain why you've got such high death rates in this slum. We were just told by one of the teachers that it's not un unusual for 10 in a class of 26 children, it's not unusual for 10 of them to be absent because of problems with diarrhea. I think this demonstrates as powerfully as anything you can think of the links between what happens in water and sanitation and what happens in education. What sort of opportunities in life do these kids have? And it's an example of how unless you can get this right, you're not going to get what happens in the school right. The answers to the problem vary from country to country. We argue that really there's a three-step approach. First, the government needs to institute the water as a basic human right, and they need to mean it. That means you don't just put it in the constitution. Everybody should have an entitlement to at least 20 litres of water a day. In the case of poor people who can't afford to pay, that water should be free. Secondly, the international donor community needs to do much more. And thirdly, we argue that we need a global action plan for water. Water is not on the GH agenda in a credible and serious way. If the world is serious about tackling the water crisis, we need international partnerships to come up with the solutions. 200 years ago, you had child death rates in cities like New York and Chicago and Paris and London and Manchester that were just as bad as you got in Kibera today. Now, what, what changed the story in those cities was that governments decided that that was enough. They, they saw the huge human cost associated with the deficit in water and sanitation. They saw the damage that it was doing for economic growth, productivity, and they did something about it. And what we need to see is governments in Africa, in the developing world, and in rich countries doing something about this now. This, this really has to end tomorrow. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, Krista, do you want to comment, if you say anything? Um, the one thing that struck me there was the water pipes that we spoke about talk about before I was, there was no pipes at all. So they had to, all of their waste went to a stream, and they, they either got, well, like, washed the clothes in that stream, I think, or um, what I had seen were water trucks that would come by. Also, could you comment on the size of Kibera oh, population yeah. and, and land mass? Yeah, you'll see this in my slides. Um, what I did was try to find something that you guys can relate to just to show you how big it is. And it's approximately the size of Ohio State, including West Campus. And it houses a million people. 
so yeah. you can see why there's some issues there. Um, okay, anybody else comments? <clears throat> yeah. I'm gonna be the indignant, uh, disconnected, rich person here. Why are there so many people there? Is there anywhere else to go? Why don't they fight whoever's throwing their excrement in this pile? Say, hey, don't you want this going into my house? It's Krista. Not a place to put it either. That's what they do. So I mean, you would think the community would be able to come together and agree to put it somewhere else. I mean, there's nowhere else to put it. There just isn't. Like, how can there be nowhere else? Uh, I guess I'm when you live in the Midwest, it's hard to imagine that. But yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, so, but let's go back to your first question. So, um, why did it live there? Move away. You know, um, comments? Yeah. Yes. Um, one reason they live there versus, like, say, out further from the city is because they can find work in rich areas. So, where they're at now, they can get some transportation to where they can get to work. Whereas, if they lived out further, say, like, outside of the city, they wouldn't have work. So, they would be worse off. I mean, yeah, I think the, the I suspect there's um, quite a few other reasons too. Um, some, I, I don't know about this location, but um, land ownership is, is really quite different in the developing world than it is um, the traditions of the United States. In the United States, you had this situation where you invited a bunch of form, you know people from Europe in or whatever, and you put them at the starting line, and they all run out and grab a huge swath of land and become a farmer. I mean, you know, Homestead Act, all that. You know, this didn't really happen in a lot of countries. Um, the colonial ownership of property, um, you assume that that was all broken down when colonialism ended. But the answer is it did not you know, in, in major important ways. So what often happened is if someone stayed, rather than going back to England, for instance, they still own it. They're not giving it away. Or the local wealthy that were associated with colonialists um, own it. They're not giving it away. This is, this is a major issue in many countries, actually. Um, land ownership across Latin America, for instance, this is a major issue. Um, but it's also an issue throughout the developing world. So, so, you know, um, and, and, and if they own it, it doesn't mean that's being used either. That's one of the big problems. If wealthy people own a piece of land and it's not being used at all, it doesn't mean they're going to let someone be a squatter on it or something like that. Okay. Now, the locations I've seen where um, people could get, like, free land because they don't have a job, they don't have money, are really poor conditions. Read this. Or up the sides of mountains, okay? Um, and uh, you know, in some countries, they'll even have a, a law that says, you live there for whatever, 20 days, it's yours. Well, why? Well, because nobody else wants it, okay? Um, and, and, and living in those conditions can be a pretty bad situation because you know, they build some um, house and uh, don't put in the proper foundation because they don't know what they're doing or they don't have the money to do it right. And uh, when it rains, landslide happens and it all comes down. And a lot of people get killed. This, this is happening. This is very typical. Yes, Krista. Um, another thing, particularly in Kenya, is there's a lot of tribal and clan rivalries. So I don't know how much that affects things in the city, but I know outside of the city that's a huge problem where they still fight over land and power. So for you saying they may stay in a location simply for security. Mm -hmm. And when you see some of these locations, though, you might be like a little surprised. That's secure. <laughs> but everything's relative, right? I mean, if you've got a war going on or some other conflict, it may be quite secure. I mean, people aren't stupid, man. I mean, they're going to they're gonna be there... You know, people are very sensitive to security issues. It's like number one, really. And uh, if so, it's a bunch of trade offs. I mean, if you look at the, the migrations that go on to the cities, um, 
it's, there's huge migrations to cities in, in over many years. Um, and, and in some countries, it's due to a war in the countryside. And uh, people aren't secure, and they, have to, they don't have a better option. You know, they're in a very tough situation. Now, there's a homework problem on this. Uh, so you notice the, pro the issue there was, he, said that he, he drew out a sequence for us, right? Sanitation, mountain of poop, water contaminated. Adverse impact on health, adverse impact then on education. About one third of the kids not going to school a day because of health problems with diarrhea. And, and listen, you know, most people have diarrhea in their life and think, eh, what's a big deal? It's a big deal because you gotta be thinking, not just like typical diarrhea, you gotta be thinking of cholera, okay? I'm talking major, major problems, okay? On but guess what? It's more problematic than that line because every one of these interacts with every other one, right? Can you see that? Every one impacts every other one. Why? I'll pick two random ones. Pick health. How does health, how does your health affect sanitation in that direction? Well, if you're not healthy, you're going to be able to sit, fix a sanitation problem? How does education affect health? Well, education affects hygiene. You're not born learn, like I said before, you're not born knowing how to wash your hands, etc. If you're a parent, you know that. You teach your children how to do hygiene, how to brush their teeth, etc., etc. Um, if you have education, you can go back here to the first two and start trying to solve those problems, right? So there's this huge interconnectedness that creates a real problem. And uh, maybe demands what? Well, I mean, it's almost like it, it, what you want to do in development sometimes is you want to say, I'm going to pick the most basic thing, and I'm going to try to fix that. If I fix that, everything else will get fixed. I don't know if that's really possible here. A good strategy might be to start here. But you can't just start there most of the time with water because this problem exists too right alongside it. More people in the world have clean water than they have good san sanitation. So over 2 billion people in the world still don't have good sanitation. Okay? Uh, it's less than a billion on um, having access to water. So, so their intercoupling makes it virtually impossible to focus on one thing. Okay? Um, okay, so, so what happens if you have health problems? That's what we're going to focus on today. Well, lower work productivity, that's pretty obvious, okay? Which, of course, is gonna, can lower your income, depending on how bad your health is. As they said, it lowers school attendance. You don't learn about hygiene, then that affects health. And you don't learn how to fix sanitation problems, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these are incredibly um, tightly coupled. Um, some people say you need a holistic approach. You need to address everything at once, okay? Well, you might have to at least start with the first, the first two. We'll work on those together, okay? So, the World Health Organization is the go-to place for statistics and information on health. Um, in particular, if you go to their, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this right now. We're gonna go to the um, Health Topics tab and then we're going to go to the data tab and look at malaria, water, and sanitation. We're going to view an interactive graph, go to our old friend Guatemala. And uh, so let's see. So here we are at the World Health Organization. Under health topics, check this out. Incredible detail on lots of things, uh, any kind of health thing you can think of. Look at this. Unbelievable. Okay, this is a very large... Um, organization. So um, under the the data tab, if you go if you go there and uh, uh, there's sort of a uh, you know many many things here. Um, oh, there's something popping up on syphilis there. Here's something on uh, malaria. Okay, and under malaria, you can see some of the basic stats. You see the map there. You can tell where. Uh, problems are um, with malaria basically all of Latin America um, um, Africa South Asia 
Um, on the cases, um, 207 million um, with 627,000 deaths, all right? um, which is a pretty incredible health problem. A lot of people say this is the low-lying fruit in health, um, and a lot of people are going after trying to fix this problem. Okay? It affects so many people. Um, now, another one that I thought we might take a look at is, because it's so relevant to engineering, is water and sanitation. Um, so, um, there we have the, the less than billion number I just quoted, 748 million, um, 250 billion need better sanitation. One, one billion, imagine that, one billion people using open defecation, which means basically if you're in a rural area, you go out in the farmer's field or whatever, okay, um, in the urban area, it's really quite a tough situation. So you, you see that that Cabrera, unfortunately, is not some kind of anomaly. I mean, this is, there's a lot of this going on, okay? Um, now, what's fascinating here is if you go up under... Um, this guy, View Interactive Graph. All right, so um, you, you have, uh, oh, you gotta see if we can read this thing. Uh, um, so this is portion of the population using improved drinking water sources. Uh, and uh, greater than this guy right here, if flashing light blue, that's the locations where greater than 90% are using improved water sources. That's where the water's good, okay? Um, I don't know what's surprising there. Um, and then um, 76 to 90% the, are the cyan color now. Um, let's see, cyan color, 76 to 90%, oh, 50 to 75, less than 50. So you see, the water problem is quite significant in, in Africa, of course. That's what you're seeing there. Um, be all this, this light blue right here, um, Papua New Guinea. Um, uh, is that Cambodia, I believe? Okay. Um, and uh, you know, so that you, you can get a lot of information off this site. Um, we have a few water groups here. This is a fantastic site um, for, for generating information um, on various countries. Uh, if you go down here, you can pick particular countries. Guatemala here. Um, and it, it clicked and you put a bar right here. Okay, so they're in the 76 to 90 percent have improved drinking water. Okay, um, and uh, so you can find out information on particular countries. Um, the movie thing isn't so great because it doesn't have like a lot of annual data there. Um, but the the site, the, the, if you go to the other pieces of the on the other health information, it's got these kind of things for many different aspects. So it's it's really uh, um, quite useful. So um, this is really in many ways a go-to site for health issues. But keep in mind, the World Bank is really nice too. It's got it's got quite a bit of information. Uh, I think I'd go to this WHO and the World Bank for information on health. Um, okay, and then. Uh, um, I th oh yes, I thought it was interesting to look at, um, if we go back up um, to data, um, essential health technologies. Um, now I'm not going to get into like lists of, I want to show a little bit of this, but we're not going to get into too much detail, but lists of medical devices, they're <laughs> saying what? what's really the most basic things um, that are needed um, at various healthcare facilities or clinics. Um, and then uh, uh, you can get in here, and I'll let you study this, but 
I think if you're, we have, uh, I think more than one biomedical engineer in here, this is a really a, a great site to take a look at if you'd like, okay? Um, that's really all I wanted to say about it. Um, so in terms of uh, health information and big picture, you, you wanna go to the World Health Organization and then the World Bank. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about a book that I read in order to put this together. Um, it's by Richard Skolnick. So he had uh, greater than 35 years experience in health education development. He's lecturer at universities. He worked at the World Bank for a number of years as a program he head for Southeast Asia. And the book uh, that he wrote that is the leading book in this area is Global Health 101. Guys, I'm only, I'm only gonna cover uh, the key pieces of that that are most relevant to humanitarian engineering. So, he starts out by saying, why is global health important? And he says, well, diseases spread widely um, and they may affect you. Um, we know that, you can think of SARS or AIDS or whatever, okay? So we have a vested interest in keeping everybody in the world healthy. Also for social justice reasons, um, there, he says that there's just too much unacceptable suffering. Uh, he says it also affects global security. This is another reason why people argue that we ought to be focusing on development. You know, the hearts and minds idea, um, rather than you know, rather than the bombs idea. Um, so, so uh, he says that health, you know, is basic development, and therefore um, should be um, focused on. So then he cites the World Health Organization Constitution definition about what health means. And he says it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Okay. So in this context, in, they're including your typical, we think of health, you for, most people think first of like, you know, um, getting a disease or, or having a flu or things like that, but they're including mental health right alongside. Um, and of course, we already talked about that a little bit earlier in class when we came to the homeless in the United States and the problems of mental health um, in that population. Uh, but of course, the incidence of mental health is, it seems to be the same in the developing world as it is in a place like the United States. And uh, as Marcia Sen pointed out, the toughest cases uh, he feels are mental, mental and physical disabilities. And his estimate is that there's 600 million people in the world with mental or physical disabilities. In, in the, and that includes, of course, many in the developing world. Okay, um, so um, there's sort of a, if you want to work on sort of the worst, quote, cases, that you should give consideration to this. Um, so first thing, um, determinants of health. What sort of impacts health? Well, first of all, you know, in the lottery of genes, you, you have a basic genetic makeup and it affects your health, okay? You inherit things um, from your parents and so on and so forth. Um, your sex impacts your health. Um, for instance, there's a lot of health problems associated with pregnancy. Um, your age, of course, impacts your health, all right? Other things that impact your health later in life, for instance, is having a he healthy child development early on is very important. Uh, having healthy behavior and coping skills, healthy behavior, things like hygiene, okay? Um, Having access to health services, of course, is important to get better. The physical environment, including water sanitation and air pollution, we are gonna be focusing a bit on these today. Um, and then your social environment, including socioeconomic status. Higher socioeconomic status people are generally healthier. Why? Because they're getting good health care. They have education. They keep themselves healthier, easier. Social capital, social capital what that means is your relationships with others and your network. And if you have the right network, it can help keep you healthy because you, you've got, for instance, a spouse that'll help keep you healthy or a mother or a father or relatives or friends. You know, if you've got that network, it can also impact you quite a bit. Culture, anti culture does impact health, what's acceptable and not acceptable in terms of health care, for instance, but also just sort of traditions. <laughs> Um, and gender norms, okay, so what, what's, and especially with respect to, um, with respect to women um, and all the health issues associated with, 
with uh, having babies. Okay, so uh, employment and working conditions, um, this is quite a major issue. A lot of people in the developing world do backbreaking hard labor. Okay, that adversely affects your health over a long period of time. Okay, when, my, when I told my father when I was seven years old and I was being a laborer for him as a bricklayer, and I said, Dad, I want to be a bricklayer. And he looked at me and said, Kevin, you are not going to be a bricklayer. And here's why. <laughs> you know, no way do you want to do this. Okay? Um, but he loved his job. I would have been just as happy doing that, too. But anyway, um, employment and working conditions, think of the sweatshop, think of the hard labor, think of farming, you know, etc. I mean, clearly those will have a major impact on health. There's also called the so-called social determinants of health, or SDH. So these are conditions, sort of the broad conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. So these circumstances are shaped by a distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels. Think Cabrera. Okay? These are, these are the circumstances somebody's born in. A kid can't be blamed for being born in Cabrera. Okay, can, can you blame them for not being healthy? No, I mean, it just is. Um, the social determinants of health are mostly responsible for health, the so-called health inequities. So that is the so-called unfair or, unavo or avoidable differences in health, and there are, these are significant differences. Next, public health people have something they call a socio-ecological model. Um, so they say that social context matters and behavior matters. And this is important to say because uh, we're engineers, we need to be reminded that it's not just technology that impacts health, it is many other things, in particular the social context. So consider this diagram, this is a classic diagram for public health. So on the left side, the little, little circle, that's the individual. So they have knowledge and attitudes, beliefs, and personality, and this all affects their personal behavior, affects their own health. But, as I mentioned a moment ago, they've got a network around them, their social network, immediate social network, like with family, friends, and peers, okay? But living within that network, we, we, we also have a broader context of institutions with rules, regulations, policies, and informal structures. OSU against the rules to smoke on campus anywhere. That's the example. We live in an institution, it's got its rules with respect to health, and we're supposed to follow them, okay? Um, and then within the community, well, social networks, okay? Social norms or standards, sort of what's expected. In the United States, um, it's pretty much expected that you bathe once a day, okay? Um, and, you know, that's often followed. Um, sometimes it isn't. Okay, um, and then public policy at the local, state, federal, and federal levels about health. You know, these are things like vac laws about vaccinations, for instance, um, laws about traffic safety. And there's a, this whole system within which we live that helps keep us healthy. Okay, where you know whether or not you need a motorcycle helmet. Okay, Ohio, you don't have to, right? Um, whether you have to wear a seat belt in Ohio, you do have to, okay? And all of these issues are, are this broader context of what helps protect us and keep us um, healthy, okay? Now, you can see by my examples that a lot of that was behavior, but it sort of interacts with technologies too. Technology is a vaccination, a seat belt is a technology, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of all coupled in there, but the people stuff matters. Next, environmental health. And this is the key contact point, uh, well, the first key contact point with humanitarian engineering. Uh, so pollution. We talked about outdoor pollution earlier, climate change, you know, uh, the problem of carbon, um, you know, um, and so forth. But I want to talk about indoor pollution now. So basically, um, coal, cow dung, wood, and logging waste, and crop waste are used for fuels for cooking and heating by about half the people in the world. Wow. What's that? That's 3.5 billion people. Okay. Now, with proper ventilation, this could work. Okay. The problem is, is this is the typical situation. 
Top pictures from Guatemala. Okay. Um, I, and I bet uh, Aaron was with me. We were in a house, and the, the, the tradition is they cook an open fire, and well, you call it a house, it's just a one room. And in a scorched up all the side of the wall, you know, you saw in Living on One Dollar, right? They're in that smoke, in it, and they're walking in out of that house. Okay, so huge problem with indoor pollution. Okay, um, who solves these problems? Well, we need, you know, cook stoves and, and better fuels. Um, uh, we need lower polluting fuel. We have to have maintenance on these things. You got to keep children away from the cooking area, keep them safe from getting burned, but also from the smoke inhalation. Okay, and several types of engineering are relevant um, to this problem. Uh, uh, to try to stop, come up with better solutions for for this. Um, the respiratory problems for these sorts of things are, are really pretty profound. Um, the other thing that's a, a classic problem is um, is lighting, um, pollution from lighting. Um, so the classic example is you're in Bolivia, you live up in the up in the mountains. It's really cold at night, so you shut your your hut down, okay, and you turn on your lantern, but it's kerosene, okay, because that's the cheapest approach, and it pollutes inside, and you breathe it while it's on, okay, and then you breathe it the rest of the night. Terrible respiratory problems for everybody, okay. Um, so you think, well, wait a minute, what about solar lights and power? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so these problems um, can be solved by a number of types of engineers. This is really a very um, important thing because if you can fix this problem, well, you know, if you have this kind of an issue here, she's cooking inside, okay? Ventilation might be tough, but if you get a cook stove, um, you can usually pour it out of the, the place and, and avoid a lot of the pollution that's coming from the cook stove. Even though on a cook stove, I don't know if you're familiar with these, but on the side, they usually have a hole. You can shove logs in, so you're going to get some smoke in the house. But if you can reduce it a lot, uh, that can be um, really valuable. Comments? Question? Okay. Um, next, sanitation, water, and hygiene. So if, if you do a proper disposal of human waste, you have reductions in diarrheal disease, intestinal parasites, and trachoma. Uh, if you do improper disposal, you contaminate water and food sources and you spread parasitic worms. Um, what are the solutions? Well, toilets or latrines, water supply, boreholes, dug wells, rainwater collection, um, and uh, you know, the, the, I think you know, can see now that you know, via the movie in particular, emphasizing the importance of sanitation um, and water. And I, I can tell you that, you know, this issue uh, is really profound in terms of its impact, this water problem. Um, so you see the lady there with the green tub on her head? You know, this is very unpleasant to carry water. I, I don't know if you've ever tried to carry water. Uh, water is extremely heavy. Um, and. Uh, I knew that from working with my dad in Brooklyn because you make when you make cement you use water and you have to carry this this it's, it's unbelievably heavy and uh, I can't imagine doing it on my head oh that's that's like wow and as the woman in the movie was she was had the yellow uh, jug thing carried on her back I mean they're usually it, from what I understand they're carrying maybe forty pounds this is a lot of weight to carry a long ways this is really hard on the women, and then it's also, the children help with this too. But the women are really the ones that are getting this job. So if you can get water, you're gonna free up the women to do other things, like work on whatever else, right? Um, and it's gonna be a lot easier on them in many ways. A great example, if you wanna see a movie on this, and we're gonna come to this later, but I just mentioned it now, Dr. Pixler um, and his uh, um, design outreach in the, uh, pump. We'll talk about that next um, when we get to chapter four. That's a, but it's a fantastic example. Okay, so um, next technology for global health. Um, well, biomedical engineers and electrical engineers and probably others too. Probably some chemical engineers. Um, diagnostics. You want affordable diagnostic approaches that are um, specific and sensitive. 
provide easy to interpret results. Um, vaccines, uh, affordable, safe, and effective, require a few doses, can give lifelong immunity. Um, and you want to focus on some of the bad diseases in the developing world, okay? Uh, we, we tend to focus all our money, our pharmaceutical industry, et cetera, focuses on investing in drugs that are needed for the developing world for, quote, us, right? And because they can make a lot of money on those, right? But somebody in this area could make some fantastic contributions by making things that are along these lines. Um, Drugs that are affordable, safe, and effective, um, et cetera, and delivery services. So th there's all kinds of engineering opportunities here. Um, there's great information also on the web, on um, technologies for global health. There's an organization um, called uh, Engineering World Health, uh, which is an engineering um, organization focused on global health and in particular clinical engineering um it's been around a long time the director actually gave a talk um to an ecos group back in 05 um robert malkin um so i think um there's lots going on in this area a lot of engineers get involved in this area i think it's a fantastic opportunity to try to work on things and if you look at the health the whole health big picture you realize that a lot of engineers can work the health problem Okay. It's not just it's not just biomedical engineers, and it's not just civil and environmental engineers. It's also mechanical, and it's electrical, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what are our lessons? In many ways, um, health, a lot of people would argue that the most basic issue is health in development. Um, you know, it's the, it is in some sense the starting place. Now, I know you can argue that point. However. Consider the following. I mean, you got Bill Gates goes and makes his billions on starts the Gates Foundation with his wife Melinda, gets a donation of thirty-seven billion from Warren Buffett. Um, and what? Go look at their website. Look at what they focus on. It's almost all health. It's amazing. You think he'd be focused on computer science? You know, he's not. He's focused. I mean, they're, they're picking, they're, they're trying to make their dollars the most effective at helping, right? So he's, he, they study the whole thing and say, health is where it's at. I mean, they're investing a lot of money in it, okay? So I, I, I can see why they are too. And then if you go back and you say, well, wait a minute, how else do I tell about priorities? Well, go to the Millennium Development Goals and count the number of them that focus on health. Go to the new Sustainable Development Goals. Look at what they're looking, talking about health. Health is really a big issue, whether it's for men or women or both. Like in, in the remember the Millennium Development Goal on maternal health? Okay, so it's all over the place. Health is really, really fundamental, okay? Fortunately, humanitarian engineering uh, disciplines seem to almost all apply to the health problem. So we can help. Um, and what I like about it in particular is you're getting at root causes. I mean, there's the engineers are coming in, and they're focused on getting the clean water, not fixing the diarrhea that's going to happen again tomorrow. Getting them clean water so it doesn't help it at all. Okay. Same thing with sanitation, indoor pollution. Okay. So eliminating the root causes. That's really a, a nice thing to be focusing on. We'll be talking in chapter four, engineering for community development about why it's important to focus on root causes if you can. I am not saying that you shouldn't um, also focus on symptoms. Sometimes if you fix symptoms, people themselves can fix root causes, okay? But there's something sort of deeply satisfying about getting at a root cause. Um, for instance, um, Greg Bixler's talk on design outreach he gave last semester uh, for the Humanitarian Engineering Center um, discusses this issue, the impact of getting good water to an African village. Um, and it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Okay. Um, that's all I have.